to do with the persecuted prophet. Let's uh, begin, if you would, please turn back where uh, we read last um, class from Second Chronicles chapter 36. Of course, this is a chapter that had the occurrence of Jeremiah referred to three different times in the three different contexts that reflected forth the threefold message of the book of Jeremiah. Second Chronicles 36, and just picking out a couple verses. First of all, verse 15, where it says, And Yahweh Elohim of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, the prophets, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. If you have the Oxford wide margin, look at that word betimes there. It's not very familiar to us, but you see in the margin, it says continually and carefully. And so God would send his messengers, the prophets, continually and carefully unto the people. And the reason is, this verse says, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. This is the mercy of God. He has compassion on his people, and he wants them to change from their ways of iniquity. The prophets sought to change the people's ways for their good, and in turn, they were persecuted. It's going to be helpful for us just to bear in mind throughout this class, brothers and sisters, that the prophets were expressions of the mercy of God. We turn over to Matthew chapter 23. This is a familiar chapter to us. This is the eight woes that the Lord speaks against the, the scribes and the Pharisees. But just note the emphasis um, that, ca- that takes place near the end of this chapter that the Lord speaks of and perhaps Again, if you have a colored pencil and you like to do these kind of things, you might just have pick a color just to color in the persecution of the prophets as spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ. So Matthew 23, first of all, verse 29. In this particular woe to the scribes and Pharisees, those hypocrites, the Lord says, ye build the tombs of the prophets. Verse 30 speaks of the blood of the prophets. Verse 31, ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Verse 34, wherefore I send unto you prophets, some of them ye shall kill and crucify and scourge and persecute. See, throughout this last woe, the Lord is speaking of the persecution of the prophets. And then, of course, in verse 37, that famous verse, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee under, gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. We're familiar with the reference that we just put on the screen, James 5, verse 10. Take my brethren, says James, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. So the prophets, and particularly I would say Jeremiah, is a wonderful example to us of patience and of enduring affliction. What we'd like to do now is just to create a list from three different New Testament passages. So first of all, Matthew chapter 5 being, of course, the Beatitudes. Luke's parallel record being Luke chapter 6, and then Hebrews chapter 11. These three different passages of the New Testament to that speak of how that the prophets were persecuted, uh, persecuted, and then compare them with the experiences of Jeremiah. So the Lord said concerning the prophets that they were reviled. 
Jeremiah 18 and verse 18 says, this is Jeremiah speaking, Come, and let us smite him, sorry, not, this is the people speaking of Jeremiah, Come, and let us smite him with the tongue, and not give heed to any of his words. And so they reviled Jeremiah. In Matthew 5, the Lord says that the prophets were persecuted, and Jeremiah would say in his 17th chapter in verse 18, let them be confounded that persecute me. Of the prophets, the Lord would say that they were spoken against falsely. In Jeremiah 37 verse 14, Jeremiah said, it is false, but the captain hearkened not unto him. He was spoken against falsely. The Lord said concerning the prophets that they were hated. Jeremiah 20 and verse 10 says, All my familiars watch for my halting, saying, We shall take our revenge on him. Concerning the prophets, the Lord Jesus would say that they were separated from their company. That is, they endured loneliness. Jeremiah 15 verse 17, Jeremiah says, I sat alone because of thine hand. For thou hast filled me with indignation. And again, the Lord says that the prophets were reproached. Jeremiah 20 verse 8 says that the word of Yahweh was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Their names were cast out as evil, says our Lord. That is, the prophets were spurned. And Jeremiah 15 and verse 20 says every one of them doth curse me. And then looking at the the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we're told that the prophets endured cruel mockings. And Jeremiah 20 and verse 7 says, Jeremiah said, I am in derision daily, every one mocketh me. We're told in Hebrews 11 that they had scourgings. And we read in chapter 20 and verse 2, then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks. They would endure bonds, says Hebrews 11. And Jeremiah 40 in verse 1 says, When he had taken him being bound in chains. And so they were imprisoned, Hebrews 11 goes on to say. And Jeremiah 37 verse verse 16 says, Jeremiah was entered into the dungeon and the cells and remained there many days. And Finally, Hebrews 11, the prophets suffered affliction. Jeremiah 38, verse 9, These men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die for hunger. Brothers and sisters, do you feel for this man? This man who endured all this because of one thing, for being a faithful mouthpiece for God. What we would like to do is to go through chronologically a portion of the book of Jeremiah to paint the picture of the hardships and the progression of trial, similar to the servant songs of Isaiah. And of course, time only allows for a recap of this very large book concerning the hardships that uh, Jeremiah endured. But as we do go through this chronologically, brothers and sisters, just bear in mind, as we said earlier, that the prophets were expressions of God's mercy. He is trying to reach out to his people. He's trying to change them so that he would not have to destroy them. So let us begin chronologically chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Verses 17 to 19. This is right when, at the very beginning, when Jeremiah, as a very young man, is ordained a prophet to the nations. And this is part of the message that God gave to him. Jeremiah 1, verse 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins, Jeremiah, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, 
against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the princes, the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith Yahweh, to deliver thee. How would you feel, brothers and sisters, if you were given your life's commission and told that everyone would fight against you? Kings, princes, priests, people, a whole nation would wage war against this man. He was trying to save them. They were trying to destroy him. As we looked at in our last class, brothers and sisters, Josiah, good King Josiah of Judah, reigned for 31 years. And so for 18 years, these two young men, Josiah as the king, Jeremiah as the prophet, worked side by side, trying to reform a nation. And with Josiah on the throne, there was much that was accomplished as they, they tried to change the people. But we read in the book of Jeremiah that it was of an external nature because Jeremiah would expose the wickedness of their hearts. But these were the best times of Jeremiah's life. Not only was he fully supported by a faithful friend and king who sat on the throne, but there were also others who would share the same goal. There was Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. There was Mordecai. We don't often think of him. How about Joel and Ezekiel? Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and even Ezra. Many of these individuals, brothers and sisters, would have been youths who were influenced, who grew up in, in the CYC, as it were, in Judah, influenced by Josiah and Jeremiah. But all those people that we just mentioned and the other faithful, they are the good figs. And in time, one by one, they would be taken away into captivity, into Babylon, leaving Jeremiah and only a couple others who were valiant for the truth. And we know what happened as we saw in our last class, in 609, Josiah went up against Pharaoh Necho in the Battle of Megiddo and was slain at the age of 39. We're told that the future mourning of the Jews when they realize what they have done to their Messiah is likened to the mourning for Josiah in the Valley of Megiddo in Zechariah chapter 12. It was one of the greatest lamentations there ever was. We read in 2 Chronicles 35 and verse 25 that Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the lamentations. And in Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 20, Jeremiah spoke of the loss of his friend, of Josiah. When he said, the breath of our nostrils the anointed of Yahweh was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the heathen. But now with Josiah slain, no longer would Jeremiah live under the protective shadow of a faithful king. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 12, if you would. So during this time of Jeremiah 12, Jeremiah has actually been speaking his message to the people for 17 years and nothing has been fulfilled. <laughs> Think how difficult that would be to be a prophet. You're speaking the same message that there's a power that's going to come down from the north, come against Judah and take Jerusalem. He's been speaking that same thing for 17 years and it hasn't come to pass yet. And so in verses 1 to 4 of Jeremiah 12, he asks God, why are the wicked prospering? This is God's answer in verse 5. God says to Jeremiah, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, and how canst thou contend with horses? 
And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? In other words, brothers and sisters, God is saying, Jeremiah, you're weary from running against footmen, but you're going to run against horses. That is, if you find it hard prophesying while well, Josiah is king, your faithful friend, what are you going to do when wicked men who have no regard for God sit on the throne? If you are weary at a time when the land is at peace, then what are you going to do in the coming turmoil of destruction and judgment? Because you see, brothers and sisters, thus far, no one had attempted to take his life. That would come. He has not known the fiery pain of the lash. It would come soon enough. He has not known the torturous ache of many hours in the stocks. But it was in store for him. He had not yet experienced the breathless fear of pursuers searching for his hiding place, but it was soon to be. He has not yet experienced the mental agony of solitary confinement in horror dungeons. It would soon scar his life. Not yet was, was his skin black with famine. Not yet did his skin cleave to his bones. Not yet did his form become like a stick. Not yet did he pine away in hunger. This was all to come. And don't ever think, brothers and sisters, that Jeremiah wasn't affected by these things. Many who have studied um, sadness and depression in Scripture have studied the life of Jeremiah. Just get a hint in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 2. Jeremiah 9 verse 2, Jeremiah says, Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. You see what he's saying there? Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place, a cabin for travelers. He wanted to get away. If only he could get away from it all. If only he could just have a cottage in the wilderness where he could get refreshed by some peace and solitude. But there was no resort for him to get away to, as you and I sometimes do, brothers and sisters. There was once that he tried to get away, but it ended terribly for him. But we'll come to that by and by. Well then... If he can't go off on holidays, at least on occasion, he could get together with his friends and enjoy some good food and an enjoyable time, as you and I also do. Actually, we find that no, he couldn't. And we see that if we would turn to chapter 16, verse 8. Jeremiah 16, verse 8 says, Thou shalt not also go into the house of feasting, says God to Jeremiah, to sit with them, to eat and to drink. And so we see that as part of his prophetic ministry, he was not allowed to enjoy feasts because he was a prophet who had to live his message. And God was showing that through his way of life, that the voice of mirth and the voice of the bride and the groom would cease. Well then, at least Jeremiah could share the joys and sorrows of his life with his wife, a soulmate who would help and assist him and be a companion to him. But actually, he wasn't allowed to get married. Jeremiah 16, verse 1 and 2. The word of Yahweh came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife. Neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. You tell a 21-year-old that he can't get married ever and see how that goes across. There would be no life companion for him. 
I think there's many hints throughout the books of, Jer of Jeremiah and Lamentations that show that Jeremiah liked children, but he would never have any of his own. The days were coming, as we've seen already, that this scene, and a whole lot worse, was going to be common for Jeremiah to experience, and it had a huge effect on him. We said earlier, brothers and sisters, that there was a time when Jeremiah tried to get away. He tried to escape out of the city, but it ended terribly for him. And we see that story that takes place in Jeremiah chapter 37, just prior to the reading of chapter 38 that we had. So you turn to Jeremiah 37. Verse 4, Now Jeremiah came in and went out among the people, for they had not put him into prison. So not yet had Jeremiah experienced the dungeons and the cells and the cisterns that he would shortly experience by and by. But it won't take long. Verse 11 and 12. And it came to pass that when the army of the Chaldeans was broken up from Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army, then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. So you see what Jeremiah is doing here? It's quite interesting. He's doing what Christ would later tell the disciples to do at the time of AD 70. When you see Jerusalem encompassed by armies, the Roman armies, and then they go away for a period of time, that's your opportunity to flee to the mountains. Interesting that Jeremiah is doing, trying to do the same thing. The Chaldeans had surrounded the city, as we saw in verse 11, but it was broken up because they heard message that uh, Pharaoh Necho was coming against them. They left the city. This was the opportunity to leave, and Jeremiah takes that opportunity. But look what happens. Verse 13. Then Jeremiah, sorry, verse 13, And when he was in the gate of Benjamin, so he made it that far, a captain of the ward was there, whose name was Urijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah. And he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Thou fallest away to the Chaldeans. Then said Jeremiah, It is false, I fall not away to the Chaldeans. But he hearkened not to him. So Urijah took Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. What had the Lord said, do you remember? Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 15, Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah, and smote him, and put him in prison, in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison. And so we see that Jeremiah is beaten, and he is put into prison. And our Lord had said, Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. Verse 16, When Jeremiah was entered into the dungeon and into the cabins, and Jeremiah had remained there many days. It's not cabins as, it, as we think of cabins, certainly, or as you see in the margin, it's cells. So he has been put into the dungeons and into prison cells. And he is there for many days, we're told. This is the cistern, this dungeon, if you look up the word, it's the cistern of the house that is now dry. There's no water in it. It's the same word, actually, for the word pit that, Jer that um, Joseph was cast into by his brothers. Same word, pit. He's put there and he's left for many days, we're told, and without any food. And so they had designed for this faithful prophet of God a slow and an agonizing death. So think about it, brothers and sisters. This individual, this man, is at the mental state where he has to just mentally get away from it all. But he gets caught in the process, and it goes from bad 
to worse. He's physically beaten, he's thrown into solitary confinement, and he's left to die. Verse 20, Therefore hear now, I pray thee, this is Jeremiah to the king, O my lord the king, let my supplication, I pray thee, be accepted before thee, that thou cause me not to return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. He was dying, brothers and sisters. Verse 21, Then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jeremiah into the court of the prison, and that they should give him daily a piece of bread. Daily a piece of bread out of the baker's street until all the bread in the city were spent. Thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. He gets a single piece of bread each day. It gets worse. Chapter 38 follows on chronologically from chapter 37. We see that while he is in the court of the prison, Jeremiah is still able to get his message out to the people. Despite all of his hardships, he will faithfully proclaim the word of Yahweh, continuing a great example of suffering affliction and of patience, as James told us. Have a look at verse 2 through to 4 of Jeremiah 38. This is him being faithful. He's still proclaiming the message, even though he's in the court of the prison. And so he says, Thus saith Yahweh, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, and by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. Thus saith Yahweh, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in the city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. Can you imagine those words being spoken concerning this man? After all that Jeremiah had done, in giving and dedicating his life, to trying to save the people, they in turn say, oh, he seeks the, the hurt of the people and not the welfare. And so Zedekiah says in verse 5, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Melchiah, the son of Hamelech, that was in the court of the prison, And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. This cistern was deep. It was not dry like the previous one. Although we're told that it didn't have water either. It had mire. And I want us to try to create this scene mentally in our minds, brothers and sisters, of this man being let down with rope into inky black darkness with its dank, horrible smells while his enemies reviled him from above. His feet would recoil with fearful disgust as they touched the slime, but there was nothing he could do. There was nothing to grab a hold of to prevent his oozing descent. The ropes were pulled back up, and with some final reproaches yelled down upon him. His enemies rolled the stone over the opening. And the record simply says, so Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Not dissimilar to the crucifixion of the Lord, where it simply says, and there they crucified him. So just like to get the feelings of our Lord Jesus Christ, we need need to go back to the Psalms. So it is to get the feelings of Jeremiah at this, this time. We need to go to the book of Lamentations and chapter 3. Because in Jeremiah chapter 3, Jeremiah is recalling his sufferings in this dungeon. Jeremiah 3 and verse 52. 
Mine enemies chased me sore, like a bird, without cause. They have cut off my life in the dungeon, and cast a stone upon me. So you see, these cisterns would have had heavy stone lids to prevent children and others from accidentally falling into them. And they rolled a stone over the mouth of the dungeon, sealing his fate. And because this particular cistern we're, cistern, we're told, was not dry, it seems that it was connected as part of the sewer system or the gray water system of the palace. And so then as water was released in the palace, there would be a flush of liquid that would pour into the cistern before draining away. And we know, as was read for us in Jeremiah 38, that when Jeremiah was pulled out of the dungeon, they put ropes under his armpits. That's not the best way to pull out a frail person from slime. It would be better to make a sling in which they could sit to pull them out. But I think this is an indication of how deep Jeremiah was in this slime. It's only his armpits that were above this muck. And so with him, brothers and sisters, this deep in this mire, you can imagine what would happen as water would come flushing in into the cistern. Verse 54 says, Waters flowed over mine head. Then I said, I am cut off. I called upon thy name, O Yahweh, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. And I personally wonder, brothers and sisters, if God sent an angel to this dungeon to strengthen Jeremiah. In the same time period, we know of angels going to the faithful servants of God to assist them. We know that there was an angel in the burning fiery furnace with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know that there was an angel sent to shut the lion's mouth when Daniel was in the lion's den. And along with that, it's the language of the next verse, verse 57. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidst, fear not. And so I wonder if God did send an angel to Jeremiah, to this prison, to say to him, fear not. Verse 57. So we, uh, we just read that. But God did hear Jeremiah's breathing and his cry, and he delivered Jeremiah through the courageous hand of ebed melech the Ethiopian. So back in Jeremiah, the next chapter is chapter 39. So chapters 37, 38, and 39 are all in chronological order. Jeremiah 39, verse 11. So this is now the time period where Jerusalem is taken and the people are taken captive. And Babylon, or, or um, Nebuchadnezzar is going to give commandment concerning um, Jeremiah and what his princes are to do with Jeremiah. So verse 11 says, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, and look well to him, and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. So Nebuzaradan, and the captain of the guard, sent, and Nebuchadnezzar, and Rabsaris, and Nergal Sharizer, and Rabmeg, and all the king of Babylon's princes, even they sent, and took Jeremiah out of the courts of the prison, and committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home. So he dwelt among the people. Again, let's think about this, brothers and sisters. Jeremiah is about 60 years old. It's unlikely that the wounds of his lash had ever been properly cared for. He has endured starvation among many other deprivations. 
So brothers and sisters, have you ever pictured Jeremiah looking like that? Jeremiah describes himself in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 4. My skin and my bones hath he made old. Lamentations 5 verse 10, our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Let's just read verse 14 of Jeremiah 39 again carefully. They sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Gedaliah that he should carry him home. Jeremiah wasn't just sent on his way, brothers and sisters. He was committed into the care of Gedaliah, who had to pick him up and carry him to his home. So here's something for us to think about, brothers and sisters. When Jeremiah was starving, there were no ravens to bring him bread and flesh twice a day, as it was provided for another prophet. Nor could Jeremiah multiply oil. When Jeremiah was in the stocks, there was no earthquake to free him as it was for another disciple. When Jeremiah was arrested, he could not send fire from heaven to consume the officers when they came to get him, as another prophet did. When Jeremiah was cruelly mocked, there were no she-bears that tear in pieces the oppressors, as happened for another prophet. When Jeremiah was in Jonathan's prison for many days, no angelic visitor awoke him and led him out of the prison, as happened for an apostle. When Jeremiah was pulled out of the dungeon with mire, it was not like it was for Daniel's three friends coming out of the fiery furnace upon which there was no hurt nor even sign of fire. And of course when we say these things, brothers and sisters, we're not saying that these others did not suffer affliction for the Lord's sake. But we are saying that there was nothing of a miraculous nature that delivered Jeremiah from his afflictions. Just like, brothers and sisters, there was nothing of a miraculous nature that delivered our Lord Jesus Christ from his sufferings. And nor should we expect miraculous deliverance from our trials. Well, brothers and sisters, we've not considered half of the hardships of Jeremiah, but it is enough. Would you just turn to Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 1. Lamentations 3 and verse 1, Jeremiah says, I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. And isn't that true? Would any of us question that? He is the man that hath seen affliction. Brothers and sisters, this is the same man who would write verse 21 to 26. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of Yahweh's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Yahweh is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Yahweh is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of Yahweh. Indeed, brothers and sisters, our Lord said that the prophets suffered greatly, but he also said that their reward would likewise be great. We'll just conclude with the picture that we get in Jeremiah 32. You don't need to turn it up. But the picture that we get in that chapter, brothers and sisters, is that when Jeremiah was in the court of the prison, God told him to go and to buy his cousin's field, which was in Anathoth, 
near to Jerusalem. And Jeremiah did so. And as he was instructed, he put the title deeds for that field into a vessel that we're told would continue for many days. And the implication, brothers and sisters, of that story in Jeremiah 32 is that that same vessel containing those title deeds continues even today, hidden and untouched waiting for the time when the Lord Jesus Christ himself will conduct a ceremony and will send someone to fetch that very vessel and dusting off the dirt of many centuries, they'll open it and present those very title deeds to Jeremiah to inherit forever a field that lies near to the prince's portion.